Good morning. Welcome. Thank you for joining us today. We're so glad that you've tuned in to join us. Let me invite you to turn with me to the New Testament book of Hebrews, the book of Hebrews chapter 9, book of Hebrews chapter 9. That's where we're going to find our main text this morning, Hebrews chapter 9. I believe that every word of the Bible is true. There was a businesswoman on a crowded airplane flight. After the plane took off, she pulled out her Bible and she began to read. And the man sitting next to her saw the Bible and she, he said, you really don't believe the Bible, do you? And she said, as a matter of fact, I do. I believe every word. But it's just a bunch of fairy tales, like that guy got swallowed by a whale. What's his name? And she said, well, his name was Jonah, and I believe he was swallowed by a whale, and he survived to tell about it. Well, can you tell me how a man can be swallowed by a whale and live to tell about it? She said, I don't know how, but I suppose that when I get to heaven, I'll just ask him. And the fellow said, but what if Jonah's not in heaven? And without missing a beat, she said, well, then you can ask him. In this section of Hebrews, the writer is pointing out that the old covenant is now obsolete because Jesus came to deliver the new covenant. How many of you remember the first VCRs that came out? They launched a video revolution because instead of having to watch a television program live, you could record it and watch it later. Well, you could do that if you had a pocket full of cash. The first VCRs were huge boxes that cost over a thousand dollars each. And you pretty much had to have a degree from MIT to figure out how to even program the things. At one time, there were millions of VCRs in America flashing 12 o'clock. <laughs> but the prices and the size eventually shrank. And most Americans compiled a huge stack of bulky video cassettes with stuff on it that you thought was worth preserving at the moment. And how many hours did you spend at the movie rental trying to pick out tapes with, with uh, you know, um, stuff that um, you just felt was important and you couldn't miss seeing what to what to watch, um, you know, and and then you would see those signs that says please uh, please be kind, rewind. Now, kids today, they don't have any idea what all that means. But now we have newer technology. We have DVRs that record shows on a hard drive. And some folks are only streaming videos these days. The new technology made the VCR obsolete. Well, when Jesus came, he made the old covenant obsolete. We're all familiar with the story of Jesus coming to our planet Earth 2,000 years ago. But in our passage today, we read about not one, not two, but of three appearances of Jesus. See if you can pick them out as we read through this passage. To get a running start, let's begin back in verse 22 of Hebrews chapter 9. And according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood. And without shedding of blood, there is no remission. Therefore, it was necessary that the copies of the things in the heavens, speaking about the earthly tabernacle, should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has not entered the holy place made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Not that he should offer himself often, as the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood of another, he then would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world. 
But now, once at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. The two New Testament books with the greatest amount of theological truth are the books of Romans and Hebrews. Now, Romans is all about who we are in relationship to God, and Hebrews is all about who Jesus is in relation to us. In the New Testament, the ministry of Jesus is expressed in terms of past, present, and future. In the very first chapter of the book of Revelation, we read where Jesus says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is, that means present, and who was, that's the past, and who is to come, that's the future, the Almighty. See, God is not limited as time, as you and I are. So from his perspective, there is no sense of past, present, and future. At the burning bush, Moses said, what's your name? And God said, tell the Israelites, I am has sent you. Now in Hebrew, that means I have always been, I am being, and I always will be. God isn't limited by past, present, and future, but we live in a linear timeline. We, we measure minutes and hours and days and years. So God has revealed himself to us in a framework that we can understand, past, present, and future. Now, what I want to do in this message this morning, I want to touch on the theological truth of the three appearances of Jesus, and then we'll end with the practical application of this truth. Now, here's the first appearance. Jesus came to remove the penalty of sin. It's said in our scripture, but now, once, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Now understand, we were sinners who needed a Savior. And Jesus became the first time to die on the cross on, to take away our sin. See, all the Old Testament law did was to remind people, you can't keep it. Think of it this way. Humanity is like a man who's fallen down in a well. And when he cries out for help, another man looks down and says, what do you want? And the fellow in the well says, I want to get out of here. And the guy looking down into the well thinks for a moment, he takes a piece of paper and a pen, and he writes something down, and he drops the paper down into the well. Now the man in the well, he picks it up and he reads it, and on the paper it says, 10 rules on how to stay out of wells. See, that's like the Ten Commandments. It was a set of rules to tell us to keep out of wells after we had already fallen in. But here's the problem for most folks. They don't know they have fallen in a well and need help. And so, you know, this guy, he thinks he was made to live in wells, and he can't understand why he's unhappy and he's searching for something. See, the law only reveals our problem, but it doesn't give us a solution. That's why Jesus came. In Luke chapter 19, verse 10, Jesus said, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save those who are lost. Paul wrote to Timothy, and he said, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. Before you can ever be saved, you must admit you are lost. Jesus came to take our place in the well and boost us out of the well. He saves us and then he instructs us on how to stay out of wells. That was his first appearance, to take away sin. The second appearance, Jesus appears now before the Father on our behalf. 
We read in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 24, Christ has entered into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us. We read in Hebrews chapter 7 that Jesus is our high priest who makes intercession for us. When we place our faith in Christ, Jesus removes the penalty for our sins uh, through, you know, the, the penalty being death and hell. But we still have a problem with those occasional things that we stumble into. When we become Christians, we don't suddenly, you know, become perfect and sinless just like Jesus. But we do have a new desire to end sin in our lives and to become like Jesus. According to the first chapter of Job, we have an adversary who is also an accuser. In Job chapter 1 verse 11, the devil accuses Job of being a good guy simply because God has blessed him. Satan said, you know, you bribed Job, but if you bring pain into his life, surely he's going to curse you to your face. Of course, Satan was wrong. It's his nature to accuse, though. In Revelation chapter 12, the Bible describes Satan as the accuser of the brothers and the sisters who accuse them before God day and night. But thankfully, for all the brothers and sisters, we have someone up there who speaks up for us on our behalf. Satan accuses us before God day and night, but Jesus continually makes intercession for us. Hebrews chapter 7 verse 25 says, Therefore he, speaking of Jesus our high priest, therefore he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. First John chapter 2 Verse 1 says, My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Now here's why we need an advocate before the Father. I was saved when I was 11 years old, Easter Sunday night, 1973. At the moment I placed my faith in Jesus Christ, every sin that I ever committed was forgiven by the blood of Jesus. And I wish I could report to you that I've been a perfect little saint since then, but I'd be lying if I said that. I've had my moments of anger, (laughs) bad attitudes, arguing with the Lord because I didn't like what he told me to do. There have been times that my mouth has engaged before my brain has kicked into gear. I've wrestled with pride, and I've hurt others, and I've had to go back and ask forgiveness from them. In fact, I'm sure the devil has said, God, do you see that Tracy Stevens, he can't be one of yours. Look at him. He's committed all these sins. And that's when the Lord Jesus appears for me and says, Father, he's one of ours. He gave his life to me when he was a boy. He confessed me before others, and I confess that he is saved and cleansed by the blood. And the devil's going to accuse you as well. When you stumble and you fail, he's going to sidle up to you, and he's going to whisper, you're no good, you're no good, you're no good, baby, you're no good. And you should say, you're right, I'm no good, but I have been forgiven by the blood of the Lamb, and I have an advocate at the Father's throne, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He gives me assurance that I am his. Now there's a third appearance that we see of Jesus. Jesus will return as the conquering king. The Bible says to those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. Now, this third appearance is actually what we call the second coming. 
Jesus is here and now in the person of his Holy Spirit. He dwells in us. He inhabits his body, the church. But one day he's going to return for his bride. In Acts chapter 1, we're told that Jesus remained with the disciples for 40 days after the resurrection. Then he took them to the top of the Mount of Olives and he ascended back into heaven. And as he slowly disappeared from their sight, there were two angels that were standing there. They said, men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking up into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Jesus came the first time to bear our sin, and he did that when he died on the cross. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24 says, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. And when he comes a second time, he won't be coming as the gentle Jesus, meek and mild. He's going to return as the King of kings and Lord of lords. He came the first time as the Lamb of God to take away the sin of the world. He'll return the second time as the Lion of the tribe of Judah. When he came the first time, he was judged, tortured, and killed by evil men. But when he comes the next time, he will come as the judge. When Jesus came the first time, he tasted death. When he comes the second time, he will have the keys to death and to hell. Are you ready for the return of Jesus? Now, I don't know when it's going to happen. Nobody knows. And as I've said before, I'm not on the scheduling committee. I'm on the welcoming committee. The apostles all believed Jesus would return during their lifetime. And if his coming was thought to be near back then, how much closer must it be today? John wrote to the believers in 1 John chapter 2, verse 28, And now, little children, abide in him, that when he appears we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If Jesus returned today, would you face him with confidence or shame? The last recorded words of Jesus out of Revelation chapter 22 are, Yes, I am coming soon. And the very last prayer of the Bible is where John exclaims, Amen, even so, come, Lord Jesus. If you're a follower of Jesus, you're going to meet the Lord in one of two ways. First, if you die before the return of the Lord, you're going to meet him in heaven a fraction of a nanosecond after you die. The Bible says that death is to be absent from the body and at home with the Lord. Second, if you are a part of the generation of believers who are alive when Jesus returns, Scripture says that we will be caught up to meet him in the air in the fraction of a nanosecond. So there, you have the correct theology of the three appearances of Jesus. He appeared first to take away sin. He appears now in heaven as our advocate before the Father. And he will appear in the future when he returns as the conquering king. Now that's the theology, but what about us? <laughs> what about the euology and the meology? What does it mean for all of us? Well, that leads to a personal question. Am I prepared for my final appointment? You know, the passage tells us, and as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. When the Bible says it is appointed for men to die once, it is speaking of the absolute certainty of death. You know, we live in a day of uncertainties. Someone said that the only two certain things are death and taxes. But there are a lot of folks who have figured out how to avoid paying taxes. But nobody except Jesus figured out how to cheat death. 
It's the only true certainty. And none of us knows when we're going to die. People are living longer and longer these days, but when you consider 90 years in the span of eternity, that's just a blink of the eye. In the book of James, we are asked, what is your life? You are a mist that appears for just a little while and then vanishes. Have you ever walked out on a crisp, cold morning and noticed your breath created a little vapor cloud? It was there for a second, and then it vanished. That's our lifespan in light of eternity. But death doesn't end at all. This verse says that just as certain as death is, then there's judgment. When most people hear that word, they immediately think of that final judgment described in Revelation chapter 20. John wrote, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, from those who, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and the dead were judged according to their works. The lake of fire is the second death, and anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. You know, the most prominent painting of the, in the Sistine Chapel is The Last Judgment by Michelangelo. It's a huge painting that covers the entire front wall. In it, Jesus can be seen with his hand raised as if he's issuing orders. In the bottom of the picture, he painted people who were crying out in anguish from being sentenced to eternity, separated from God. Now here's the bad news. If you live your entire life rejecting God's free gift of eternal life, you will be standing before God in this judgment. <laughs> but here's the good news. If you've placed your faith in Jesus Christ, you don't need to fear this judgment. The Bible says in Romans chapter 8 verse 1, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Oh, we're going to have to stand before God. That's not the issue. But, but when we stand before him as believers, we can be confident knowing that our sins have been forgiven. See, we face a different kind of judgment. We will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. But this isn't going to be a judgment of condemnation. It will be a judgment of reward and rejoicing. How would you answer these personal questions? Are you ready for your final appointment? Are you ready to die? Are you ready for judgment? But there's not only a personal question, there's a personal affirmation. You are ready to die if you have placed your faith in Jesus. You remember Jesus spoke these words to Martha, who was mourning the death of her brother Lazarus. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live though he dies. Now, because of these three appearances of Jesus, we don't have to fear death. We can face it with confidence. When the Apostle Paul was in prison, he knew that he could be executed any day. And as he contemplated his death, he made this affirmation in Philippians chapter 1, verse 21. He says, For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. So, death for a Christian isn't loss, it's gain. <laughs> what will we gain? Well, we will gain the literal presence of Jesus. See, now we see Jesus through a fogged up mirror, but then we will see him face to face. We'll gain the freedom from pain and worry and stress and fear. We really can't lose. It's like saying, Heads I win, tails I win. One of the most inspiring autobiographies I read as a teenager was the story of Eddie Rickenbacker. Rickenbacker 
you know, first became famous as a race car driver and set the world speed record of 134 mile an hour way back in 1910. When World War I broke out, he became a fighter pilot. He was called the Ace of Aces for shooting down 24 German planes, and he received the Medal of Honor. Later, he became president of Eastern Airlines. In 1941, he was a passenger on the Eastern Airlines DC-3 when it crashed outside Atlanta, Georgia. Most of the passengers were killed, and he was terribly injured. He was pinned under the wreckage all through the night. And as rescuers arrived, he directed them to others before he allowed them to remove him. He had serious wounds, including a crushed hip, a dented skull, a crushed elbow, and a broken knee. He had many internal injuries. While in the hospital, he suffered a massive hemorrhage and almost died. In fact, some newspapers reported his death with front-page headlines, but he didn't die. He was a committed believer with a strong faith, and as he lingered between life and death, he had an experience that changed his life and it deepened his faith. In his autobiography, he described the sensation of being near death. He wrote, I began to die. I felt the presence of death and I knew that I was going. You may have heard that dying is unpleasant, but don't you believe it. Dying is the sweetest, tenderest, most wonderful sensation I have ever had. Death comes disguised as a sympathetic friend. All was serene and calm. How wonderful it would be to simply float out of the world. It is easy to die. You have to fight to live. Rickenbacker was a fighter. He survived after spending five months in the hospital. He would slump and walk with a limp for the rest of his life. He later said, God saved me to serve him. And God gave him a number, uh, another 32 years of life. But after that experience, Eddie Rickenbacker said he was never afraid to die. And because of Jesus, you don't have to fear death either. Jesus came to take away your sin, and he is appearing before the Father right now, and he will return in glory someday. Are you prepared for your final appointment? If you place your faith in Jesus Christ and you accept him as your Lord and Savior, you too can say as Paul, to live as Christ and to die is gain. Or you can say like John, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for our time together. Lord, we just pray that you would just help us to recognize that we need to be ready for our final appointment. Lord, we recognize that Jesus came to save us from our sins. We recognize that Jesus is at the right hand of the Father right now making intercession for us, and that one day he will return as King of kings and Lord of lords. Father, I pray that each of us would make our salvation. Lord, just help us to know that uh, we are ready for, for death. Lord, help us as we stand before judgment, not to be uh, afraid, but to have confidence because we have placed our faith in Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you and we praise you. We ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you for joining us today. Next Sunday, we're going to be continuing our sermon series out of the book of Hebrews. We hope that you can join us. This coming Wednesday, we'll continue our live online Bible study out of 1 Corinthians. That's Wednesday mornings at 1030 a.m. 
Eastern Time. Thanks again for joining today. May God bless you as you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. You are loved. We'll see you next time.